Chapter 11 of Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Braunert Plunkett. Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The Crocodile, Part 1. The Crocodile. An extraordinary incident. A true story of how a gentleman of a certain age and of respectable appearance was swallowed alive by the crocodile in the arcade and of the consequences that followed. Oh, eh, Lambert! Oh, eh, Lambert! As-tu vu, Lambert? 1. On the 13th of January of this present year, 1865, at half past twelve in the day, Yelena Ivanovna, the wife of my cultured friend Ivan Matveitch, who is a colleague in the same department and may be said to be a distant relation of mine too, expressed the desire to see the crocodile now on view at a fixed charge in the arcade. As Ivan Matveitch had already in his pocket his ticket for a tour abroad, not so much for the sake of his health as for the improvement of his mind, and was consequently free from his official duties, and had nothing whatever to do that morning, he offered no objection to his wife's irresistible fancy, but was positively aflame with curiosity himself. A capital idea, he said with the utmost satisfaction. We'll have a look at the crocodile. On the eve of visiting Europe it is as well to acquaint ourselves on the spot with its indigenous inhabitants and with these words taking his wife's arm he set off with her at once for the arcade i joined them as i usually do being an intimate friend of the family i have never seen ivan matveitch in a more agreeable frame of mind than he was on that memorable morning how true it is that we know not beforehand the fate that awaits us on entering the arcade he was at once full of admiration for the splendours of the building and when we reached the shop in which the monster lately arrived in petersburg was being exhibited he volunteered to pay the quarter rouble for me to the crocodile owner a thing which had never happened before walking into a little room we observed that besides the crocodile there were in it parrots of the species known as cockatoo and also a group of monkeys in a special case in a recess near the entrance along the left wall stood a big tin tank that looked like a bath covered with a thin iron grating filled with water to the depth of two inches in this shallow pool was kept a huge crocodile which lay like a log absolutely motionless and apparently deprived of all its faculties by our damp climate so inhospitable to foreign visitors this monster at first aroused no special interest in any of us so this is the crocodile said yelena ivanovna with a pathetic cadence of regret why i thought it was something different most probably she thought it was made of diamonds the owner of the crocodile a german came out and looked at us with an air of extraordinary pride he has a right to be ivan matveitch whispered to me he knows he's the only man in russia exhibiting a crocodile this quite nonsensical observation i ascribe also to the extremely good-humoured mood which had overtaken ivan matveitch who was on other occasions of rather envious disposition i fancy your crocodile is not alive said yelena ivanovna piqued by the irresponsive stolidity of the proprietor and addressing him with a charming smile in order to soften his churlishness a manoeuvre so typically feminine oh no madam the latter replied in broken russian and instantly moving the grating half off the tank he poked the monster's head with a stick then the treacherous monster to show that it was alive faintly stirred its paws and tail 
raised its snout and emitted something like a prolonged snuffle. Come, don't be cross, Karlchen, said the German caressingly, gratified in his vanity. How horrid that crocodile is! I am really frightened, Yelena Ivanovna twittered still more coquettishly. I know I shall dream of him now. But he won't bite you if you do dream of him, the German retorted gallantly, and was the first to laugh at his own jest, but none of us responded. Come, Semyon Semyonitch, said Elena Ivanovna, addressing me exclusively, let us go and look at the monkeys. I am awfully fond of monkeys. They are such darlings. And the crocodile is horrid. Oh, don't be afraid, my dear, Ivan Matveitch called after us, gallantly displaying his manly courage to his wife. This drowsy denizen of the realms of the pharaohs will do us no harm, and he remained by the tank. What is more, he took his glove and began tickling the crocodile's nose with it, wishing, as he said afterwards, to induce him to snort. The proprietor showed his politeness to a lady by following Yelena Ivanovna to the case of monkeys. So everything was going well, and nothing could have been foreseen. Yelena Ivanovna was quite skittish in her raptures over the monkeys, and seemed completely taken up with them. With shrieks of delight she was continually turning to me as though determined not to notice the proprietor, and kept gushing with laughter at the resemblance she detected between these monkeys and her intimate friends and acquaintances. I, too, was amused, for the resemblance was unmistakable. The German did not know whether to laugh or not, and so at last was reduced to frowning. And it was at that moment that a terrible, I may say unnatural, scream set the room vibrating. Not knowing what to think, for the first moment I stood still, numb with horror, but noticing that Yelena Ivanovna was screaming too, I quickly turned round, and what did I behold? I saw, oh heavens, I saw the luckless Ivan Matveitch in the terrible jaws of the crocodile, held by them round the waist, lifted horizontally in the air, and desperately kicking. Then. One moment, and no trace remained of him. But I must describe it in detail, for I stood all the while motionless and had time to watch the whole process taking place before me with an attention and interest such as I never remember to have felt before. What, I thought at that critical moment, what if all that had happened to me instead of to Ivan Matveitch? How unpleasant it would have been for me. But to return to my story. The crocodile began by turning the unhappy Ivan Matveitch in his terrible jaws, so that he could swallow his legs first, then bringing up Ivan Matveitch, who kept trying to jump out and clutching at the sides of the tank, sucked him down again as far as his waist. Then, bringing him up again, got him down, and so again and again. In this way, Ivan Matveitch was visibly disappearing before our eyes. At last, with a final gulp, the crocodile swallowed my cultured friend entirely, this time leaving no trace of him. From the outside of the crocodile, we could see the protuberances of Ivan Matveitch's figure as he passed down the inside of the monster. I was on the point of screaming again when destiny played another treacherous trick upon us. The crocodile made a tremendous effort, probably oppressed by the magnitude of the object he had swallowed, once more opened his terrible jaws, and with a final hiccup he suddenly let the head of Ivan Matveitch pop out for a second with an expression of despair on his face. In that brief instance, the spectacles dropped off his nose to the bottom of the tank. It seemed as though that despairing countenance had only popped out to cast one last look on the objects around it, to take its last farewell of all earthly pleasures. But it had not time to carry out its intention. 
the crocodile made another effort gave a gulp and instantly it vanished again this time for ever this appearance and this appearance of a still living human head was so horrible but at the same time either from its rapidity and unexpectedness or from the dropping of the spectacles there was something so comic about it that i suddenly quite unexpectedly exploded with laughter but pulling myself together and realizing that to laugh at such a moment was not the thing for an old family friend i turned at once to yelena ivanovna and said with a sympathetic air now it's all over with our friend ivan matveitch i cannot even attempt to describe how violent was the agitation of yelena ivanovna during the whole process after the first scream she seemed rooted to the spot and stared at the catastrophe with apparent indifference though her eyes looked as though they were starting out of her head then she suddenly went off into a heart-rending wail but i seized her hands at this instant the proprietor too who had at first been also petrified by horror suddenly clasped his hands and cried gazing upwards oh my crocodile oh mein allerliebster karlchen mutter 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 a door at the rear of the room opened at this cry and the mutter a rosy-cheeked elderly but dishevelled woman in a cap made her appearance and rushed with a shriek to her german a perfect bedlam followed yelena ivanovna kept shrieking out the same phrase as though in a frenzy flay him flay him apparently entreating them probably in a moment of oblivion to flay somebody for something the proprietor and mutter took no notice whatever of either of us they were both bellowing like calves over the crocodile he did for himself he will burst himself at once for he did swallow a gun's official cried the proprietor unser karlchen unser allerliebster karlchen wird sterben howled his wife we are bereaved and without bread chimed in the proprietor flay him flay him flay him clamoured yelena ivanovna clutching at the german's coat he did tease the crocodile for what did your man tease the crocodile cried the german pulling away from her you will if karlchen wird burst therefore pay das war mein sohn das war mein einziger sohn i must own i was intensely indignant at the sight of such egoism in the german and the cold-heartedness of his dishevelled mutter at the same time yelena ivanovna's reiterated shriek of flay him flay him troubled me even more and absorbed at last my whole attention positively alarming me i may as well say straight off that i entirely misunderstood this strange exclamation it seemed to me that yelena ivanovna had for the moment taken leave of her senses but nevertheless wishing to avenge the loss of her beloved ivan matveitch was demanding by way of compensation that the crocodile should be severely thrashed while well, she was meaning something quite different looking round at the door not without embarrassment i began to entreat yelena ivanovna to calm herself and above all not to use the shocking word flay for such a reactionary desire here in the midst of the arcade and of the most cultured society not two paces from the hall for at this very minute mr lavrov was perhaps delivering a public lecture was not only impossible but unthinkable and might at any moment bring upon us the hisses of culture and the caricatures of mr stepanov to my horror i was immediately proved to be correct in my alarmed suspicions the curtain that divided the crocodile room from the little entry where the quarter roubles were taken suddenly parted and in the opening there appeared a figure with moustaches and beard carrying a cap with the upper part of its body bent a long way forward though the feet were scrupulously held beyond the threshold of the crocodile room in order to avoid the necessity of paying the entrance money such a reactionary desire madam said the stranger 
trying to avoid falling over in our direction and to remain standing outside the room, does no credit to your development and is conditioned by lack of phosphorus in your brain. You will be promptly held up to shame in the Chronicle of Progress and in our satirical prints. But he could not complete his remarks, the proprietor coming to himself and seeing with horror that a man was talking in the crocodile room without having paid entrance money, rushed furiously at the progressive stranger and turned him out with a punch from each fist. For a moment both vanished from our sight behind a curtain, and only then I grasped that the whole uproar was about nothing. Yelena Ivanovna turned out quite innocent. She had, as I have mentioned already, no idea whatever of subjecting the crocodile to a degrading corporal punishment, and had simply expressed the desire that he should be opened and her husband released from its interior. What? You wish that my crocodile be perished? The proprietor yelled, running in again. No, let your husband be perished first before my crocodile. Mein Vater showed crocodile, mein Großvater showed crocodile, mein Sohn will show crocodile, and I will show crocodile. All will show crocodile. I am known to ganz Europa, and you are not known to ganz Europa, and you must pay me a strafe. Ja, ja, put in the vindictive German woman. We shall not let you go. Strafe, since Karlchen is burst. And, indeed, it's useless to flay the creature, I added calmly, anxious to get Yelena Ivanovna away, home as quickly as possible. As our dear Ivan Matveyevich is by now probably soaring somewhere in the Imperium. My dear, we suddenly heard, to our intense amazement, the voice of Ivan Matveyevich. My dear, my advice is to apply direct to the superintendent's office, as without the assistance of the police, the German will never be made to see reason. These words, uttered with firmness and aplomb, and expressing an exceptional presence of mind, for the first minute so astounded us that we could not believe our ears. But, of course, we ran at once to the crocodile's tank, and with equal reverence and incredulity listened to the unhappy captive. His voice was muffled, thin, and even squeaky, as though it came from a considerable distance. It reminded one of a jocose person who, covering his mouth with a pillow, shouts from an adjoining room, trying to mimic the sound of two peasants calling to one another in a deserted plain or across a wide ravine a performance to which I once had the pleasure of listening in a friend's house at Christmas. Ivan Matveyevich, my dear, and so you are alive, faltered Yelena Ivanovna. Alive and well, answered Ivan Matveyevich, and thanks to the Almighty, swallowed without any damage whatever. I am only uneasy as to the view my superiors may take of the incident, for after getting a permit to go abroad, I've got into a crocodile, which seems anything but clever. But, my dear, don't trouble your head about being clever. First of all, we must somehow excavate you from where you are, Yelena Ivanovna interrupted. Excavate, cried the proprietor. I will not let my crocodile be excavated. Now the publicum will come many more, and I will fünfzig kopecks ask, and Karlchen will cease to burst. God sei Dank! put in his wife. They are right, Ivan Matveyevich observed tranquilly, the principles of economics before everything. My dear, I will fly at once to the authorities and lodge a complaint, for I feel that we cannot settle this mess by ourselves. I think so too, observed Ivan Matveyevich, but in our age of industrial crisis it is not easy to rip open the belly of a crocodile without economic compensation. And meanwhile, the inevitable question presents itself. What will the German take for his crocodile, and with it another? How will it be paid? For, as you know, I have no means. Perhaps out of your salary, I observed timidly, but the proprietor interrupted me at once. I will not the crocodile sell. I will for three thousand the crocodile sell. 
I will for four thousand the crocodile sell. Now the publicum will come very many. I will for five thousand the crocodile sell. In fact, he gave himself insufferable airs. Covetousness and a revolting greed gleamed joyfully in his eyes. I am going, I cried indignantly. And I, I too, I shall go to Andrei Osipich himself. I will soften him with my tears, whined Yelena Ivanovna. Don't do that, my dear, Ivan Matveitch hastened to interpose. He had long been jealous of Andrei Osipich on his wife's account, and he knew she would enjoy going to weep before a gentleman of refineness for tears suited her. And I don't advise you to do so either, my friend, he added, addressing me. It's no good plunging headlong in that slapdash way. There is no knowing what it may lead to. You had much better go today to Timofey Semyonitch, as though to pay an ordinary visit. He's an old-fashioned and by no means brilliant man, but he is trustworthy, and what matters most of all, he is straightforward. Give him my greetings and describe the circumstances of the case. And since I owe him seven roubles over our last game of cards, take the opportunity to pay him the money. That will soften the stern old man. In any case, his advice may serve as a guide for us. And meanwhile, take Yelena Ivanovna home. Calm yourself, my dear, he continued, addressing her. I am weary of these outcries and feminine squabblings, and should like a nap. It's soft and warm in here, though I have hardly had time to look round in this unexpected haven. Look round? Why, is it light in there? cried Yelena Ivanovna in a tone of relief. I am surrounded by impenetrable night, answered the poor captive. But I can feel and, so to speak, have a look around with my hands. Goodbye. Set your mind at rest and don't deny yourself recreation and diversion. Till tomorrow. And you, Semyon Semyonitch, come to me in the evening and, as you are absent-minded and may forget it, tie a knot in your handkerchief. I confess I was glad to get away, for I was overtired and somewhat bored hastening to offer my arm to the disconsolate Yelena Ivanovna, whose charms were only enhanced by her agitation, I hurriedly led her out of the crocodile room. The charge will be another quarter rouble in the evening, the proprietor called after us. Oh dear, how greedy they are, said Yelena Ivanovna, looking at herself in every mirror on the walls of the arcade, and evidently aware that she was looking prettier than usual. The principles of economics, I answered with some emotion, proud that passers-by should see the lady on my arm. The principles of economics, she drawled in a touching little voice. I did not in the least understand what Ivan Matveitch said about those horrid economics just now. I will explain to you, I answered, and began at once telling her of the beneficial effects of the introduction of foreign capital into our country, upon which I had read an article in the Petersburg News and The Voice that morning. How strange it is, she interrupted, after listening for some time. But do leave off, you horrid man. What nonsense are you talking? Tell me, do I look purple? You look perfect and not purple, I observed, seizing the opportunity to pay her a compliment. Naughty man, she said complacently. Poor Ivan Matveitch, she added a minute later putting her little head on one side coquettishly. I am really sorry for him. How oh dear, she cried suddenly. How is he going to have his dinner? And, and, what will he do if he wants anything? An unforeseen question, I answered, perplexed in my turn. To tell the truth, it had not entered my head. So much more practical are women than we men in the solution of the problems of daily life. Poor dear! How could he have got into such a mess? Nothing to amuse him, and in the dark! How vexing it is that I have no photograph of him! And so now I am sort of a widow, she added with a seductive smile, evidently interested in her new position. Hmm. I am sorry for him, though. 
It was, in short, the expression of the very natural and intelligible grief of a young and interesting wife for the loss of her husband. I took her home at last, soothed her, and after dining with her and drinking a cup of aromatic coffee, set off at six o'clock to Timofey Semyonitch, calculating that at that hour all married people of settled habits would be sitting or lying down at home. Having written this first chapter in a style appropriate to the incident recorded, I intend to proceed in a language more natural, though less elevated, and I beg to forewarn the reader of the fact. 2. The venerable Timofey Semyonitch met me rather nervously, as though somewhat embarrassed. He led me to his tiny study and shut the door carefully, that the children may not hinder us, he added with evident uneasiness. There he made me sit down on a chair by the writing table, sat down himself in an easy chair, wrapped round him the skirts of his old wadded dressing gown, and assumed an official and even severe air in readiness for anything, though he was not my chief nor Ivan Matveitch, and had hitherto been reckoned as a colleague and even a friend. First of all, he said, take note that I am not a person in authority, but just such a subordinate official as you and Ivan Matveitch. I have nothing to do with it, and do not intend to mix myself up in the affair. I was surprised to find that he apparently knew all about it already. In spite of that, I told him the whole story over in detail. I spoke with positive excitement, for I was at that moment fulfilling the obligations of a true friend. He listened without special surprise, but with evident signs of suspicion. Only fancy, he said, I always believed that this would be sure to happen to him. Why, Timofey Semyonitch, it is a very unusual incident in itself. I admit it, but Ivan Matveitch's whole career in the service was leading up to this end. He was flighty, conceited indeed. It was always progress and ideas of all sorts, and this is what progress brings people to. But this is a most unusual incident and cannot possibly serve as a general rule for all progressives. Yes, indeed it can. You see, it's the effect of over-education, I assure you. For over-education leads people to poke their noses into all sorts of places, especially where they are not invited. Though perhaps you know best, he added, as though offended, I am an old man and not of much education. I began as a soldier's son, and this year has been the jubilee of my service. Oh, no, Timofey Semyonitch, not at all. On the contrary, even Matveitch is eager for your advice. He is eager for your guidance. He implores it, so to say, with tears. So to say with tears, hm? Those are crocodile's tears, and one cannot quite believe in them. Tell me, what possessed him to want to go abroad? And how could he afford to go? Why, he has no private means. He had saved the money from his last bonus, I answered plaintively. He only wanted to go for three months to Switzerland, to the land of William Tell. William Tell? Hmm. He wanted to meet the spring at Naples, to see the museums, the customs, the animals. Hmm. The animals. I think that was simply from pride. What animals? Animals, indeed. Haven't we animals enough? We have museums, menageries, camels. There are bears quite close to Petersburg. And here he's got inside a crocodile himself. Oh, come, Timofey Semyonitch, the man is in trouble, the man appeals to you as to a friend, as to an older relation, craves for advice, and you reproach him. Have pity at last on the unfortunate Yelena Ivanovna. You're speaking of his wife, a charming little lady, said Timofey Semyonitch visibly softening and taking a pinch of snuff with relish. Particularly prepossessing, and so plump and always putting her pretty little head on one side, very agreeable. Andrei Osipitch was speaking of her only the other day. Speaking of her? Yes, and in very flattering terms. 
such a bust he said such eyes such hair a sugar plum he said not a lady and then he laughed he's still a young man of course timofey semyonitch blew his nose with a loud noise and yet young though he is what a career he's making for himself that's quite a different thing timofey semyonitch of course of course well what do you say then timofey semyonitch why what can i do give advice guidance as a man of experience a relative what are we to do what steps are we to take go to the authorities and to the authorities certainly not timofey semyonitch replied hurriedly if you ask my advice you had better above all hush the matter up and act so to speak as a private person it is a suspicious incident quite unheard of unheard of above all there is no precedent for it and it is far from creditable and so discretion above all let him lie there a bit we must wait and see but how can we wait and see timofey semyonitch what if he's stifled there why should he be i think you told me that he made himself fairly comfortable there i told him the whole story over again timofey semyonitch pondered hm he said twisting his snuff-box in his hands to my mind it's really a good thing he should lie there a bit instead of going abroad let him reflect at his leisure of course he mustn't be stifled so he must take measures to preserve his health avoiding a cough for instance and so on and as for the german it's my personal opinion he is within his rights and even more so than the other side because it was the other party who got into his crocodile without asking permission and not he who got into ivan matveitch's crocodile without asking permission though so far as i recollect the latter has no crocodile and a crocodile is private property so it's impossible to slit him open without compensation for the saving of human life timofey semyonitch oh well that's a matter for the police you must go to them but ivan matveitch may be needed in the department he may be asked for ivan matveitch needed ha ha besides he is on leave so that we may ignore him let him inspect the countries of europe it will be a different matter if he doesn't turn up when his leave is over then we shall ask for him and make inquiries three month timofey semyonitch for pity's sake it's his own fault nobody thrust him there at this rate we should have to get a nurse to look after him at government expense and that is not allowed for in the regulations but the chief point is that the crocodile is private property so that the principles of economics apply in this question and the principles of economics are paramount only the other evening at luka andreitch ignati prokovitch was saying so do you know ignati prokovitch a capitalist in a big way of business and he speaks so fluently we need industrial development he said there is very little development among us we must create it we must create capital so we must create a middle class the so-called bourgeoisie and as we haven't capital we must attract it from abroad we must in the first place give facilities to foreign companies to buy up lands in russia as is done now abroad the communal holding of land is poison is ruin and you know he spoke with such heat well that's all right for him a wealthy man and not in the service with the communal system he said there will be no improvement in industrial development or agriculture foreign companies he said must as far as possible buy up the whole of our land in big lots and then split it up split it up split it up in the smallest parts possible and do you know he pronounced the words split it up with such determination and then sell it as private property or rather not sell it but simply let it when he said all the land is in the hands of foreign companies 
they can fix any rent they like. And so the peasant will work three times as much for his daily bread and can be turned out at pleasure. So that he will feel it, will be submissive and industrious, and will work three times as much for the same wages. But as it is with the commune, what does he care? He knows he won't die of hunger, so he is lazy and drunken. And meanwhile, money will be attracted into Russia, capital will be created, and the bourgeoisie will spring up. The English political and literary paper, The Times, in an article the other day on our finances, stated that the reason our financial position was so unsatisfactory was that we had no middle class, no big fortunes, no accommodating proletariat. Ignaty Prokovich speaks well. He is an orator. He wants to lay a report on the subject before the authorities and then to get it published in the news. That's something very different from verses like Ivan Matveyich's. But how about Ivan Matveyich, I put in after letting the old man babble on. Timofey Semyonitch was sometimes fond of talking and showing that he was not behind the times, but knew all about things. How about Ivan Matveyich? Well, I am coming to that. Here we are, anxious to bring foreign capital into the country, and only consider, as soon as the capital of a foreigner who has been attracted to Petersburg has been doubled through Ivan Matveyich, instead of protecting the foreign capitalist, we are proposing to rip open the belly of his original capital, the crocodile. Is it consistent? To my mind, Ivan Matveyich, as the true son of his fatherland, ought to rejoice and to be proud that through him the value of a foreign crocodile has been doubled and possibly even trebled. That's just what is wanted to attract capital. If one man succeeds, mind you, another will come with a crocodile, and a third will bring two or three of them at once, and capital will grow up about them. There you have a bourgeoisie. It must be encouraged. Upon my word, Timofey Semyonitch, I cried, you are demanding almost supernatural self-sacrifice from poor Ivan Matveyich. I demand nothing, and I beg you, before everything, as I've said already, to remember that I'm not a person in authority, and so cannot demand anything of anyone. I am speaking as a son of the fatherland, that is, not as the son of the fatherland, but as a son of the fatherland. Again, what possessed him to get into the crocodile? A respectable man, a man of good grade in the service, lawfully married, and then to behave like that. Is it consistent? But it was an accident. Who knows? And where is the money to compensate the owner to come from? Perhaps out of his salary, Timofey Semyonitch? Would that be enough? No, it wouldn't, Timofey Semyonitch, I answered sadly. The proprietor was at first alarmed that the crocodile would burst, but as soon as he was sure that it was all right, he began to bluster and was delighted to think that he could double the charge for entry. Treble and quadruple, perhaps. The public will simply stampede the place now, and crocodile owners are smart people. Besides, it's not Lent yet, and people are keen on diversions, and so I say again, the great thing is that Ivan Matveyich should preserve his incognito. Don't let him be in a hurry. Let everybody know, perhaps, that he is in the crocodile, but don't let them be officially informed of it. Ivan Matveyich is in particularly favorable circumstances for that, for he is reckoned to be abroad. It will be said he is in the crocodile, and we will refuse to believe it. That's how it can be managed. The great thing is that he should wait, and why should he be in a hurry? Well, but if... Don't worry, he has a good constitution. Well, and afterwards, when he has waited? Well, I won't conceal from you that the case is exceptional in the highest degree. One doesn't know what to think of it, and the worst of it is there is no precedent. If we had a precedent, we might have something to go by. But as it is, 
What is one to say? It will certainly take time to settle it. A happy thought flashed upon my mind. Cannot we arrange, I said, that if he is destined to remain in the entrails of the monster, and it is the will of providence that he should remain alive, that he should send in a petition to be reckoned as still serving. Hmm, possibly as on leave and without salary. But couldn't it be with salary? On what grounds? As sent on a special commission. What commission and where? Why, into the entrails, the entrails of the crocodile, so to speak for exploration, for investigation of the facts on the spot. It would, of course, be a novelty, but that is progressive and would at the same time show zeal for enlightenment. Timofey Semyonitch thought a little. To send a special official, he said at last, to the inside of a crocodile to conduct a special inquiry is, in my personal opinion, an absurdity. It is not in the regulations. And what sort of special inquiry could there be there? The scientific study of nature on the spot, in the living subject, the natural sciences are all the fashion nowadays, botany, he could live there and report his observations. For instance, concerning digestion or simply habits, for the sake of accumulating facts. You mean as statistics? Well, I am no great authority on that subject. Indeed, I am no philosopher at all. You say facts. We are overwhelmed with facts as it is, and don't know what to do with them. Besides, statistics are a danger. In what way? They are a danger. Moreover, you will admit he will report facts, so to speak, lying like a log. And can one do one's official's duties lying like a log? That would be another novelty and a dangerous one, and again, there is no precedent for it. If we had any sort of precedent for it, then, to my thinking, he might have been given the job. But no live crocodiles have been brought over hitherto, Timofey Semyonitch. Hm, yes, he reflected again. Your objection is a just one, if you like, and might indeed serve as a ground for carrying the matter further. But consider again that if with the arrival of living crocodiles government clerks began to disappear, and then on the ground that they are warm and comfortable there, expect to receive the official sanction for their position, and then take their ease there? You must admit it would be a bad example. We should have everyone trying to go the same way to get a salary for nothing. Do your best for him, Timofey Semyonitch. By the way, Ivan Matveitch asked me to give you seven rubles he had lost to you at cards. Ah, he lost that the other day at Nikifor Nikiforich's. I remember. And how gay and amusing he was. And now the old man was genuinely touched. Intercede for him, Timofey Semyonitch. I will do my best. I will speak in my own name as a private person, as though I were asking for information. And meanwhile, you find out indirectly, unofficially, how much would the proprietor consent to take for his crocodile? Timofey Semyonitch was visibly more friendly. Certainly, I answered. And I will come back to you at once to report. And his wife? Is she alone now? Is she depressed? You should call on her, Timofey Semyonitch. I will. I thought of doing so before. It's a good opportunity. And what on earth possessed him to go and look at the crocodile? Though, indeed, I should like to see it myself. Go and see the poor fellow, Timofey Semyonitch. I will. Of course, I don't want to raise his hopes by doing so. I shall go as a private person. Well, goodbye. I am going to Nikifor Nikiforich's again. Shall you be there? No, I am going to see the poor prisoner. Yes, now he is a prisoner. Ah, that's what comes of thoughtlessness. 
I said goodbye to the old man. Ideas of all kinds were straying through my mind. A good-natured and most honest man, Timofey Semyonitch. Yet, as I left him, I felt pleased at the thought that he had celebrated his fiftieth year of service and that Timofey Semyonitchs are now a rarity among us. I flew at once, of course, to the arcade to tell poor Ivan Matveitch all the news. And indeed, I was moved by curiosity to know how he was getting on in the crocodile and how it was possible to live in a crocodile. And indeed, was it possible to live in a crocodile at all? At times it really seemed to me as though it were all an outlandish, monstrous dream, especially as an outlandish monster was the chief figure in it. End of The Crocodile Part 1